What is sound? Well, there's the obvious. Sound is something you hear. Sound? Actually, it's silence. It's the uh, vibrations between space. The reason sound is silence is because without sound, silence doesn't exist, and without silence, sound doesn't exist. Sound is close, very close to your origin or to your own being. I use sound as, as a vehicle to amplify what's going through me in terms of thoughts and feelings and ripples through my soma. get an identity, to get an essence, is all the work of, of, of an improvising musician. I just would play, you know, the way I felt that I should play, and everybody thought it was strange. There's an element that each musician brought to the music. Now, th these elements could have ar arisen from what they couldn't do or what they could do. Okay, meaning that a drummer may say, well, I don't play time because I can't play time. So therefore, I had to create, I don't feel comfortable playing time, so I had to create a whole nother style to accommodate what I could do. Other people would say, well, I'm tired of playing time and I want to play this way or I hear this way. When the great uh, Afro-American musicians came to this country, they came with their musical traditions like everybody else who came here with their baggage and their, and their ideas, but it's all in the head, you know? And then, manifestation time, you know? And it happened, uh, you know, like it happened anywhere in New York. I mean, I, happen, I pick up a trumpet and, mm, man, that's interesting, you know, he struggles with it. And uh, he develops uh, his own personal language from other people too, you know what I'm saying? So autodidactic development is sort of like a, a, a running on um, on on uh, a spirit, which is a self-organization. In my own work, I'm striving to eliminate reason. You could just turn that off. I know for me, it was 
an environment that nurtured creativity. You know, it, it nurtured individual thought. I'm sorry for the interruption. So trying to eliminate, of course, you must understand that one needs to be programmed uh, physically and psychically in order to create music, create this sound to deal with. By programming, I mean educated must know the traditional systems and how they all operate. Uh, but in my own work, I'm trying to eliminate all of those aspects and rely only on intuition so that the sound, the manifestation of the sound can be as pure as possible. Oh, there was other people that, that would contribute to making their own personal statements in music. If you take it on a broad point of view, like I said, John Cage or David Tudor, you know what I mean? If you look at, oh, that's not the, no, this is American music, you know what I'm saying? American music is based on individuality. Everybody else does the clone. Arnett proved you don't have to be a clone. And Cecil did too. You don't have to play piano like Bud Powell. You can play piano like the way you want to play piano. But a monk said that. Be original. Now, being an original, man, that means hard work. It's difficult to come up with something that's going to make somebody else say, yeah, I would have done it the same way. Because most people say, no, I would do it another way. <laughs> so that, 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 made, that made improvisation the high level for an artist. You understand what I mean? About
so I came to the place where everybody comes, New York. Because here you can do and say anything you want to. If people believe it, they'll accept you. If they don't, they'll reject you, because they might reject you anyway, even if they do believe it. I moved down there about 1958, and what drew me to that was the fact that the music was going on. Um, and uh, I needed to be around the live performances of it. Uh, and this is where where it was happening. And there were people of, of, of my, you know, my contemporaries were there. And uh, I needed to, I needed to bounce off my contemporaries to get an idea of what my chances were. And the village was such a, bubbling joint, I mean, with, you know, uh, dance performances uh, done in, uh, on the street or, or, or Judson Church or something like that. So people doing art events or doing collective uh, 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 gallery events, for instance, you know, artists, painters coming together just to hang their work. Or the famous village art show, which started simply by just hanging people's work on the streets of the village, you know, became a, a, a very big type of situation. You know, and, and dance, and dance studios, modern dance, you know, and, and performance, you know, uh, the happening, you know. And having, having uh, like uh, being at uh, parties at uh, Leroy Jones' uh, loft, you know, with, with uh, him reading poetry and uh, having different types of music played was also uh, fantastic. And, uh, Of course, at that time, uh, it was uh, right in the 60s. There was uh, a lot of experimenting going on with uh, both uh, drugs and sex. So um, all kinds of strange things were, were, was happening. Chicago is an incredible place for art, really. It, it doesn't have the... Uh, the restrictions that New York has, because it doesn't have the illusion of competition that New York has. We were into educating, so we, we, the Black Artist Group, the situation was on Washington Street, which was in the heart of the black community. So we had a lot of uh, inner city children that we were teaching, all aspects of art. The other thing that, about the Black Artist Group is that we didn't only deal with just music, we dealt with uh, dance, theater, poetry, visual art painting. <laughs> Muhal Abrams had the experimental band. And you could bring anything into that band. Nobody would ever say, ha, 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 ha. We can't play that. No, they said, what it is. You be, Braxton, you bring in the piece of music with X's and circles and squares and a box and a line, and you, okay? And then a few notes. It's acceptable. And for us, learning to read these different kind of symbolic ways was very meaningful as well, right? So you got more than music. You got, you know, you got Jean Genet and A.B. Spellman and Baldwin, you know what I'm saying? Um, as well as Catherine Dunham. And, you know, everybody brought their own influence. So you were hearing, so it gave you a, a broader palette to pull from. You know, you weren't just trying to create 
off of a, say, a 12 bar blues forum, you know, you, you had to create something that had an emotional context. <laughs> So the music that was coming out of Chicago that these youngsters were uh, creating was very well received. Uh, and, and there were sessions where you could go and play this new music. If you come in there playing some old style, they would look at you funny. Whereas it used to be if you go in there and, and didn't make the changes, they would look at you funny. It had to be in the early 50s sometime when a friend took me to hear Louis Armstrong down in the city, down in New York City, Paramount Theater. Went to uh, shake Armstrong's hand and, and, he, and he took my buddy and, and myself back into the, to the dressing room. He thought we were like two orphans that shouldn't be out there without a chaperone, you know? He was very, very gracious and uh, caring and funny. Uh, but boy, that was it. That day, I, that day I decided that uh, I would try to play music because he made me feel so good. I just thought maybe I can do that for somebody else. I was sitting in class and it was like the second year or the second half of the year and I remember a woman, a student walked in and addressed the class and she said, um, was there anyone, anyone interested in joining the band? And through my head I remember the last semester we would be in class like 2.30, you know, 2 o'clock and band members would come to class with their uniform on and they would leave school early. So when she said that, that flashed through my head. Other than that, I hadn't any, you know, inkling of being a musician or even, you know. So my hand went up automatically. And from that point on, I've basically been involved in music, you know. I've been trying to figure it out since that point, you know. I came up to New York um, to go to college. And um, I used to do a lot of visual art and um, visual arts and, and languages. I was one year at Sarah Lawrence College and I left to play music. And at that time, what happened was like two, two semester, two months, excuse me, after I was there, I, I heard Sun Ra in the city. <laughs> I just fell in love with the music. We were at Roscoe's house this particular time. We were playing Art Blakey stuff. And we used to start early in the morning and we would just be there all day. This was every Saturday. And Dracia had these, uh, these recordings. Uh, he had uh, Eric Dolphy, the prophet. 
He had Ornette Coleman, The Shape of Jazz to Come. He had uh, Coltrane, I don't think it was Giant Step, it was Inchworm, it was Inchworm is on. Anyway, he had these three recordings. And we listened to these three recordings. Prior to the break, we were playing All the Things You Are, I believe, yeah. We were playing All the Things You Are. And then after the break, we played All the Things You Are again. But it was completely different. Everyone had completely, the, those three recordings, that lunch break, had completely changed everyone's consciousness. I mean, without a word. No one, we didn't talk about it or nothing. We just started back, but everyone was approaching everything completely uh, different, with much more energy, with much more freedom, with... Um, much more feeling better. <laughs> Going down the village on the weekends, listening to uh, these uh, fantastic bands, you know, Donald Byrd with uh, 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 Arp Taylor and Paul Chambers and uh, Jackie McLean, uh, you know, live at the, at the Bohemia, you know, standing outside, you know, uh, listening because you couldn't go in. <laughs> And going around the corner to cafes, to, to, you know, hold into the uh, uh, village scene, you know, with your sneakers on, you know, beginning of the Jack Kerouac and, and the Beat Generation, and, you know, just exorbitant it all, you know, Marxism, socialism, abstract expressionism. You get involved in, in the, the idea of civil rights. Of, of revolution, of poetry, of, of purpose. And it was clear purpose that really guided me into music. I mean, that was the, that was the sort of, because before that, I wasn't really taking, I didn't want to be a musician. And uh, it was that I found out that music had purpose. And that immediately said, well, I thought I could be a musician. And that was my purpose, because I, I didn't really want to um, you know, be a Black Panther, you know, although I, I did hang out extensively it, with the Black Panthers, but, you know, I, I would bring in music. I'd bring in the music of Archie Shepp and, and John Coltrane, but they weren't interested in music. I was interested in music. <laughs> mindset was being there. My mindset was, I want to, I'm, I'm there. This is what it's like. This is how you think if you're already there. 
participants free, being free, uh, thinking free, being free of certain structures. This goes back actually to 1960s and the political upheavals that were going on in the United States at the time. And the formation of a group called the AACM and the Black Power Movement and the, the neo-aesthetic of uh, consciousness and awareness throughout all of the, the arts, beatnik movement, flower power movement, hippie movement, all of these were liberating uh, philosophical approaches. So it was during that period really that this became appropriate as music, as viable sound. Because it, it all it was something in our experience, but we did not have permission to use those nuances. And it was during that uh, period that everyone was saying, it's okay, we must change the world. So all artists, were uh, made incredible changes during that period. It tried to change a system based on sound in the same way that the politics tried to change a system based on thought. All th through the 60s at different times, it was accessible. The feeling in the air was that people were trying to make a breakthrough of consciousness and doing it together. <laughs> That was the birth of free jazz in the 60s. And a lot of certain musicians, you know, Albert Eiler, Fred Graves, Sonny Murray, um, everybody, you know. That was really the birth of free jazz at that time when they opened up the music. It was a real revolution. I remember um, the story that, that uh, was told about John Coltrane once he was in, Co in Copenhagen. And um, he had just played a concert there with his quartet, I think. And Cecil Taylor was playing in the jazz house uh, Montmartre with his trio with uh, Jimmy Lyons and Sonny Murray. And Albert Eiler was, was sitting in with him. And after that, a Coltrane was there in the audience. He, after his concert, he came to the club. And Coltrane said, the way Albert was playing, that was the way he always had dreamt playing. And I think that can be heard on many of the later records of Coltrane, that he is going out in the areas where Albert Isla used to operate. You 
it's easy to see that Coltrane, he has been listening to many of the concerts that we did uh, at that time. He uh, invited several of the people that were that was around at that time to take part in his uh, ascension, uh, in his uh, recording session. But he called a lot of people and invited the people who, who had already crossed the border and could help the others get across. Ferris Sanders, Dewey Johnson, Archie Shep, John Chikai. So he brought us together and wanted us together to make this statement. One, one group of musicians all played music based on known forms. The others played on forms that were unknown and unheard of. Of course, for the general jazz audience, uh, then they, that was way too early for, for them to, uh, to start to uh, be able to, and it's probably still, yes, it's even more so maybe today, it's uh, still uh, difficult for audiences to uh, cope with that kind of uh, form because it's, it, it, it takes a lot of knowledge of music and uh, uh, most people don't have that. Uh, and uh, most people are used to only having one melody going at, at a time and uh, cannot cope with polyrhythms and polytonality and sounds that are unusual in, in, the, in, the, in the popular sound picture. Alan Silva advertised a place in New York, actually Brooklyn. He wanted some artists to come live communally. I like that idea. I've always been a communal type person. And uh, sure enough, we hit it off and he was already starting to play some pretty strong improvised music with uh, two, three bass players and two drummers. I said, well, come on over and play with us. You know. And uh, Burton um, said, what are the tunes we want to play? I said, we're not playing any tunes. We're just playing, jumping the wire. And he, he sort of fell in very well with the concept. And uh, that became a relationship between me and Burton. We went on to develop a group called the Free Form Improvisation Ensemble. <laughs> We kind of laughed and smiled at each other and said, we don't need a script, do we, to make music? Not at all. No fly shit on the paper, man. We just sat down, looked at each other, and there we were. We were gone, man. Just listened and gone. And that was the glue in that music and still is the glue in the music. If you don't know how to listen, you don't know how to play. We had this first band without no, any notation, no charts, just intuitive playing. When it was not great, it was it was a kind of a grope group. We had found we you know had a, you always have to get the outside externals in your life outside you so you can concentrate on the inner experience. So there was those periods where you have to break through maybe an argument with your girlfriend or with your wife or the bill collectors were on you or something. You had to get all that external shit our way so you could get down with the music making. And when we got to it, man, it was wonderful. Composers are interested in some kind of orderly fashion to express their tonal world, right? Uh, free jazz, on a collective improvisation concept, is based primarily on what I used to say to, in our group was musicians uh, talking to each other it, within a compositional, compositional concept, not necessarily a theme and variation concept. If you look at other world systems of improvisation, you can see the same kind of dimensions. In other words, you have something from the, from the past, which you might call an improvisational theory, which means uh, ideas. Ideas about performing music 
that give you fantastic leeway, fantastic freedom. At the same time, you have to be very studied, very disciplined, and very knowledgeable with the, with the elements of the theory in order to get this kind of freedom. found out that you can also make your own music. You don't, have, you don't always have to uh, copy other people's music. I think after having uh, worked with, uh, with uh, Contemporary Five, with Don Cherry and Archie Shep, I had some kind of intuition about wanting to do something that was different. So I was talking to Rod about uh, trying out something. So what we then did, we were talking about um, who we wanted to have in the as the other part, members in the in the group. And so and then finally, we we uh, we stumbled on Milford Graves and uh, Louis Varel. So with those two, it it really started to uh, to work. We had first of all a knowledge of the system of, that would be the tempered system, uh, chord progressions, chord theory, um, tonality, atonality, etc. all based around this system. And then of course, when you go into the other part of it, uh, going beyond the system into world rhythms, uh, 
um, microtonality, improvisation, uh, the stuff that, that uh, you know, live composition, the, the, the stuff that, regardless of system, it's the, it's the stuff that performances are made out of. We were connected to the bloodstream of American classical music, and perhaps even more connected than other people who were just genuflecting and paying lip service to it. There were no uh, rhythmical restrictions. Rhythm has opened up. Well, music opened up, so it allows you many different facets to explore. You could set up a rhythm and the other guys would uh, complement it, compliment it or, uh, or they would make, uh, yeah, they would come up with a, with a counter rhythm. And then you could again break that same uh, rhythm after having played it maybe for uh, a minute or two minutes. And um, the roles of each musician have expanded. You know, for example, rhythm section players, they don't have to just play um, in a certain place. Or maybe the more front musicians don't have to play in a certain place. You can switch these roles. You have so many different possibilities. It made it, it, made it absolutely impossible for some things to happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. And plus, man, I believe there's something in the society to weed out soulfulness, man. <laughs> yeah, it's cold. You know, and it could be like black, white, Asian, Italian, Polish, whatever, man. You ain't supposed to have it. <laughs> Unless they co opted into Hollywood and make it be a clown. You know? Look, I don't want to hear this out. <laughs> okay. There's more and more. It's getting to be breath by breath. Right. So we we ready, ready to roll? Yeah, about two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm greeting to other dimensions. <laughs> As a young musician, as an Afro-American musician, as an American musician, as a jazz musician, as a jazz musician that doesn't like, like what I see in the neoclassical um, commercial structure that's been erected around the Young Lions in the 90s, as many things that the free jazz um, body of work that existed 
did, did give me a context for my ideas as a composer. Um, the, the major context it gave me was that I actually liked the music. My idea was not only to move the music through a person's body, but through their head. <laughs> Got to make them think. I wasn't interested in being, at that point, a, quote, jazz musician, although I had to learn all of the elements that it took to be a jazz musician. I was interested in being an improviser. And in doing that, you had to learn about a lot of different things, you know? and. You had to put yourself, or I tried to put myself in, in environments that would, I could I could uh, realize how I responded to that particular situation. So, of course, you would try the blues, which is a 12-bar form. But at the same time, you would try no form at all. Because it didn't, it, did, it, it didn't use formulas for playing things. The only formula you use is your natural feeling. I remember, you know, cause thinking about my clarinet teacher and the idea of like uh, what was considered to be a pure, coherent sound. I said, wow, man, you know, Coltrane doesn't have a pure, coherent sound. And, 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 and it, it, you know, it disturbed me, but there was something about it that uh, I can't even remember the steps in between that first response, and I said, well, Coltrane is top. So you have to come with something different. So you, it puts you in a mindset of thinking free, and that's, what, that's all free jazz was to me. You know, I, I, I never used the term myself, but it was basically being free to explore all the different aspects, including uh, 32 uh, bar structures, you know, and 36251, you know turnarounds and all of that, but at the same time, improvising with just a trumpet and a dancer. How many forms in the nature? How many forms in the jungle? We're not limited to AABA, which has killed the traditional jazz thing because it was all limited to very simple structures. As many forms as there are in trees and in parks and nature and jungles, and a person who has experienced all that, has that in his collective unconscious, can come out with all that whenever he needs to. The point here is that we emphasize the creative experience and not the form. The people who didn't like it, didn't like it because it didn't conform to the forms that were established. And the people who did like it, like it for that reason. I do find that open, music lends itself to more exploration for me you know you're not depend you're not depending on a particular scale or a chromatic system you know uh, you have to dig deep and you have to pull from your own personal experiences <laughs>
collective improvisation is fundamentally a bunch of musicians talking to each other, you know, having some fun, enjoying making music together. It ain't a bunch of symphonic cats sitting down, uh, reading somebody else's music and waiting to get to the gig. You know, it's a bunch of guys sitting around uh, creating some music because that's what they do. Before the concert, sometimes I'm thinking, okay, that I want to do something I never did before. Okay, when we start the concert and the sound begins, it's like stepping into a car wash. For some reason, all the pre-sort, it gets washed away immediately. And then you're left out like on, a, on a, the ocean without a boat. I mean, that's the feel, like this big wave. What are you going to do? And then you, sometimes you wait for someone to do something and they don't do anything. <laughs> so then you have to, so then you say, so then you do something, but you don't think about it, it just happens. deal on a level of extreme freedom, not just on a level of impromptu or uh, relaxed or, yeah, he's kicking back a little bit. No, I mean, you really are taking this improvisation thing to the stars, and you need all the equipment that you can get in terms of theory, uh, in terms of your soul, your mentation, your experience, and your ability to communicate with others, you are really going whole hog with this improvisation thing. But you gotta get past your own little bag of tricks and your own cliches. Now, they're there and they're there to support you and that's great, but you gotta let them go. And that's when spontane spontaneous improvised music starts to happen. You gotta not, you, you know, as they say in, in, in theater, you can't be afraid to fall on your face. But maybe you do fall on your face a little bit. That's when it starts to happen. Mistakes are pregnant with ideas. somebody else does something and then somebody else does something and next thing you know you've built a boat in fact you've built a submarine you know and then you're sailing these waters you know and as you go on you know someone builds a sail and then someone makes a telescope and then until finally you you, you sight land and then and then and... <laughs> that boat it is the ocean This music, for me at the moment, 
it's, it's liberation. It's trying to liberate me from my own suffering and to purify my consciousness for some higher development. Now, if a music really puts that on the line, as what John Coltrane did with Love Supreme and cosmic stuff, then we have a great tradition. If it meant that I was going to be the uh, multi-millionaire with a lot of followers and stuff, you know, and uh, I could sit here and lecture to the whole world, you know, I'm not that guy. <laughs> I just want to play the bass, you know. I'm not running for any office, you know. I'm not running for any political job. I just like playing music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 